know that I'm so excited to see your faces. <clears throat> okay, Matt, it is recording. You can start. Oh, I don't want me recorded. I don't mind you being recorded, but okay. Um, I'm glad everyone's here. Yay. Okay. And I was telling uh, Brecken and Jane and Carol that I got so excited about today's class that I'd actually printed out the, uh, the sheets. I did two copies. I was just, oh, and I realized, oh, I made two copies. Whoops. Um, so I killed a couple of trees, probably. Uh, glad you're here. Um, make sure you're on mute unless it's, you know, somebody talking, but, you know, let us know if you want to say something, if you have a question. Uh, let's do a quick, um, hold on, I got to change. I've got the tool of the day is this. I'm going to try to show it. It's I don't know if you can see that really well. This is called a fine line pointing pen. And they use it also on uh, to fill cracks on windshield and auto detailing, but you can use it in calligraphy because it has a little well and you can put stuff in it. And the tip is, uh, uh, let me see if I can, Just, just it's hard to, okay, I'm shaking too much, but I'm a, spotlighted your thing, so we can. Yeah, I know. I saw my face really big. It scared me. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is really fun. And let me show you where I used it. It really helps. They have two sizes, a 0.25 and 0.50 millimeter. And it's really good if you're trying to do a lot of work with a single size like that. I don't, can you see that okay? I hope it's not blurry. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah, this is a piece I did in for Brecken and Jane's class and um, their beginning class. This is a Swedish Christmas carol and there's the end of it. So I used a 0.25 on that. So that way I could guarantee that I had everything the same size. And it also works on a border. I use it on a border for one of Reggie's classes. And so it really is a nice little tool. You can get them on Amazon. You can probably find it at the auto detailing store because it is an auto part. And it comes with a, a little cleaner thing that you can, so you can clean out the little hole and you can just wash it out in water. I've, I've had no problem washing it out. So uh, does anyone want to show off any of their I homework? I wonder what it's called again. What is it called? It's called a fine line pointing pen. And I got the, they're about, they're kind of pricey. They're about seven bucks each. They're made of brass or some type of metal or something that's acting like metal. Who knows? They're also used for decorating Ukrainian eggs. Oh, there you go. Now you're ready for Easter. Well, handle and get the Depends way. on you. On the brand. And the Ukrainians call it a kitska. That's right. A pisanka. I have one of those. I have two. <laughs> they come in different sizes, and I have electric ones, but I don't think I would need the electric ones for this. <laughs> Unless you're doing a lot of stuff. Okay. All righty. Um, I'm going to show my little homework, my oodlali. Um, and then if anyone else wants to show what they did this past month, uh, let's do that. And then we'll get right into Brecken and Jane. So this is my first one. Um, I watched the show and I thought, ooh, stained glass, you know, middle ages, and it didn't work. This is very, this to me is a failure, but because the lolly is busy, but you know, I see it on camera, it looks great. So I don't know what's going on. Cameras are weird filters. So then I didn't like that one. So I did it in color and got a background on it. So I, I like this one a lot better and I'll use this one for my bookmark. So anyway, um, anyone else want to share anything that they've done so we can be inspired for this next can month? I, can I ask something? Um, I missed the last class. So can you explain the, the bookmark again? Oh, sure. Each month we will have a word of the month and Udalali was the word of the month for last month. And then you just make put on the bookmark in the 
lettering that hand that we're um, working on for that month. There's a word of the month and a phrase of the month. And I don't remember the phrase of them. I think the phrase was absence makes the heart go stronger or fonder or something like that. Clucky said it. I watched the movie again. Um, so I like Clucky. She's my favorite character of the uh, Robin Hood show. Um, so we do that. And so like next month, let me go ahead and tell you what next month's uh, word is going to be is precious. You know, my precious, uh, what we hear Gollum talk about all the time. And then the phrase of the month is even the smallest person can change the course of the future. <clears throat> but we can do that. We can talk about that or post it online too. Uh, so that's the idea to, um, to at least do something small. That way you're not feeling overwhelmed. But then if you want to go into something larger, that's why we have the phrase of the month too. So uh, anyone else want to show any of their work for the past month? I've got one. Sure. It's backwards because I haven't brought it on the other camera. But I used oh. that until oh, I'm black. And then I um, colored it in with colored pencils and then outlined it with a white gel pen. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Really nice. I love it. Kelly, did you have one? Who did you have? Shelly, Shelly Day. Shelly had one that she was going to show, but then she didn't mute herself, so I don't unmute herself, so I don't know what she said. Can't hear you. Unmute myself. There we go. I don't know where I can't tell if you can see. It's just an envelope. <laughs> can you? Oh, here. There you go. Oh, it's really nice. So, that's it. Nice. Well, that turned out. I didn't do anything. This exciting. is the year of no just. Everything we do matters. <laughs> True. Here's my Udalali. And I did it with a automatic pen. It's very plain. Oh, that's very nice. That looks nice. Was that one of the variations, Jane, that was with last month's yes. packet? Okay. Yeah, it looked really familiar. So cool. Anything else? So that's what we'll do every month. So go ahead and do a word or do an envelope. We still want to do the envelopes based on um, so you can get the practice in and get to share our calligraphy with other people. That's what the envelopes are for. So thank you. It's good. We've got some good stuff. Okay. Um, let me make sure. Yeah, I think we're good to go. So hopefully everyone has their favorite Hobbit movie. <clears throat> Ready to, you know, there's six of them. So you got plenty of time to, I always put the movies in the background while I do it to inspire me. So um, let's go ahead and get started with, is, is there anything anyone needs to bring up to everybody? or a question or concern before we get started. I want to give everyone a chance to express their views or something. Okay, I'm going to take the screen. Okay. So here's my homework. I <clears throat> the prompt for the scribbled lives group that Carol and I are in was windows. And so what I did was I cut out the counter spaces for the first one, and then that reveals the second page. So that was my homework. Today, we're gonna start out with the B nib. Um, this is a giant B nib. I will tell you, I have never used it because the sheer size of it terrifies me. Um, but it's great for 
um, giving you some vocabulary about this B nib. This part right here is called the foot. It's where the ink makes contact with the paper, the foot. And then like the other, um, especially speedball nibs, this is the reservoir. That space in between here is where you want your ink to fill it about two thirds of the way up. You want your ink there. Um, if you're filling the brush, it's easiest just to brush the ink or paint onto the back and make sure you get the foot. Reckon you're a little bit off camera. There you go. There we go. And a little swipe into the reservoir. And then you can use that nib. The B nib, you either love it or you hate it or you hate it until you love it. <laughs> it forces you to have constant contact with the full face of the foot onto the paper. It forces you to figure out the right consistency of your writing fluid. Um, and it, it forces you to have a lot of control. So that's why we like to teach with it. Today, I'm going to use gouache because in the alphabet that we're um, t demoing teaching today, we're going to be using the B nib and then a pointed nib to square off the edges. And if your writing fluid is more opaque, you will be more successful. And because I'm lazy and I don't like cleaning things <laughs> deeply, I don't use like Moon Palace Sumi on my B nibs because they gum up and they get, you have to be constantly cleaning and swishing and I'm not good at that. So I know my weaknesses and I choose to avoid that. But gouache um, works great. You get a little bit into, let's see if I can move this without making a giant mess, into a six, a little six weld thing and you mix it until it's even you for the B nib, you want it to be about half and half. You want it thinner than cream <laughs> because with the B nib, you want thinner writing fluid than what would work for a, a, a broad edge nib because the ink has to flow through more space. The other thing you need to know about a B nib is gum arabic b nibs especially if you're using a big b nib there's a lot of space that that writing fluid has to cover and then transfer to your paper and it because metal and fluid <laughs> are not friends if you have some gum arabic on it it will help the fluid spread across the whole face of the foot and you'll get a more consistent steady line if you have all the other variables, right? The, the thickness of the fluid and the pressure and the contact on your paper. The other thing is you have to have padding under your paper with a B nib. If you try to have your sheet of paper directly on your table, you're not going to get successful lines and you, you will be sad and not enjoy it. So on your exemplar, Jane showed you what happens when you use different sizes of, um, of B nibs. If you use a B2, your letters will be very thick and you won't have as much open counter space. I'm using the B4 because that's what is on your exemplar. And 
I thought we wouldn't, the shapes are the same as what we taught for the CNIB with, a, with minor exceptions. So I don't know that we need to go through every letter, um, but uh, what I thought we would do was write a few words <laughs> that include a lot of the letters. So we'll be working at a half inch tall and the first letter we'll write is wizard. So with that until W, remember it's wider. Let's see. So there's my half inch. I'm going to make my entrance stroke and then nice and round like mother O and bulge the line and bulge the baseline and then come up and hover straight above and come down until I meet it and then curve around. And I'm looking at this counter space here so that I can match the counter space on this side. Now, here's the magic. With a pointed nib that you like, you come in and square off that edge, being careful not to make the line wider than the stroke. If you make the line wider, then you get little flared serifs, which would be fine if that's what you're going for, but a little bit more control will um, produce nice letters. So if you want to be squaring off while your stroke is still wet and that allows the fluid to be sucked in <laughs> and you don't get globs, um, if you are really good and have a very light touch with your pointed nib, you can use an EF66 because it's small and it gets you nice and close to your letter. Um, I am not really, <laughs> I don't have that light touch and the EF66 always ends up um, splaying and I get more more ink laid down than I want. The next letter in wizard is Z. So we have slightly smaller on the top because we're inspired by the Roman proportions. So you'll notice this top part is right here. Um, I just dip my pointed nib in water for this part because um, my gouache is wet enough that I don't need to add ex extra color to it. If you have dirty, <laughs> dirty swishy water that is only the water you've been swishing your, the color you're using in, you could use the dirty water on that pointed nib. The A, remember we're being inspired by the Roman proportions. So this A will look like that. And I just pull that up and out and kind of move the writing fluid around to where I want it. Um, you can decide if you want to pull this down to the baseline. Um, I do that by accident. <laughs> if you can keep your pen angle idea and have it a little bit angled, it looks 
like on the exemplar that Jane gave you. It looks like you have more control. The R. The important thing about the R and the B and the Roman D and the P's and Q's is this little counter space that we're going to include in the alphabet. The R is going to descend the stem. And now because I know I'm slow, I'm going to just square that off right now. If you get a fiber in you, between the tines of your pointed nib, get it out. <laughs> Don't try and just work with it in there. You'll be sad. Okay, so we're going to leave a little triangle of counter space. So I'm going to start in my stem ink and come up and bulge nice and round. And then I'm not going to go all the way back to the stem because it will get too hot. There'll be too many lines there. Okay, then I need to square this off. So see how much, how um, more professional, I guess, that looks compared to pulling it down to the baseline level. Then here is our favorite until D. The important thing is to not close the circle. When you try and close the circle of this round D, it ends up being less legible. So I will start a little bit lower than I would. And I'm gonna come around like mother O and bulge and bulge and stop because pushing a B nib is uncomfortable. Then, like we said last month, where we want to keep this straight until we have control of it, because if we try to put a curve on this stroke, it will definitely look like a quail <laughs> instead of a D. I put my nib down, rock it a little bit to start it, and then pull and then come around and I keep that straight. You as when you get more confident in your abilities, you can add a little bit of a swoosh or something. You could also add a little entrance right there. But um, you don't want it to look swishy or like a quail, unless Reckon. you're trying to be cute. Yes, Jane. I was just going to say, the other thing I use my pointed nib for is when my B nib doesn't totally do the stroke I wish it did, and I need to clean up any fuzzy lines. And so when I'm doing the ends of the stroke and making them square, then I also have that opportunity to clean up the stroke if I need. So I purposely didn't have full contact so I could show you what Jane means. So my, my foot lifted up off of the paper right here. So what I'm going to do is just fix it. I'm just barely touching the dust of the paper and sliding the writing fluid around to fix that stroke. Because I'm going to make an F. So the F will have that same R counter space that we talked about. So I'm starting in my ink and coming up. And I'm inspired by the O. And then the crossbar will be low and you can choose depending on your word if you want it to violate that line at all. I'm 
Okay. So if we're writing the word fairy, we can choose a different A this time. And that A will have a little bit of an entrance right here, suggesting the entrance stroke with the broad edge. And then come down at a slant and then back up into the ink and come out and then slide back up. And we have got the fiber in my pen. I pulled too much ink right there, so it messed up my counter space a little bit. When you're using a B nib, as far as I have heard, there's no wrong way <laughs> to hold the nib. So what you want is however you can hold it to produce the line you want to produce. So I hold it this way so I can see where the end of my nib is stopping. I've seen people hold it exactly this way and I can't do it because I have to pull my elbow in too tight and um, I can't see where my nib is going and that annoys me. <laughs> So, whoop, I just flung ink, flung paint off of the beanie when I flipped my pen over. Okay, so that same counter space here, the more consistent you can make your counter spaces, the more lovely your overall letters and texture will be. Okay, we have several Y's, but I'll show you the UY in case we don't, because you'll use this same, oh, I already showed you that. I will show you the VY. <laughs> so here, you could do a UI using this same beginning stroke and then just pull this stroke down into the descender area. Or you could use this Y. And a little bit of a suggestion of entrance strokes. I can already see that I have fiber in there. Just noodle it. <clears throat> okay. The S, because everyone always wants to see an S. <laughs> We're working at a quarter or uh, half inch tall and we'll start slightly below that X height and we're going to curve and then think horizontal and then curve and stop above the baseline. Then because we want the optical balance, our base needs to be sturdy and slightly wider than the top. So I'm going to hover up here come down and then move over just a pen width to make that and then come back up and start in my ink. And then we can pull that paint. Um, the E, I, 
those were the two words I wanted to do for sure. <laughs> and Frodo has too many rounds in it. So I'm sorry, guys. But while you're practicing, it is nice to write words because then you're also practicing spacing. And the and spacing is the challenge. So for we'll start with a C and then turn it into an E. Start below. Sorry. Can I just say one thing about that couple things about the S before you go on? Yes. Um, that middle part that is horizontal, you want to make sure that it stays towards the top side of the midpoint. If, if you put it below, your S is going to be off balance. So just make sure it sits on top. The other thing is I have to think pretty straight when I do the top and bottom strokes. Otherwise, mine get too loopy. And so that's something you'll just want to be aware of. Thank you. So if this will be the first stroke for the O and the C and the E and the G. So if we come back up, always start in your ink. And the difference between the O is this top stroke isn't going to curve down to meet. It's been pried open because the C is the child who is extra hungry and, and mom doesn't get to eat. <laughs> And if we turn that C into an E, your crossbar, because of optical balance, will be above that mathematical midpoint, much like the, this part of the S sits on top of that. Let's do send. There are two different ends. You could do a upside down U N. And the important part of that one is to leave the counter space like we left on the R and the F. Or you can do this Roman N. And there are different schools of thought on the ductus of the of the Roman N. One is speed. So you have made this line and you need your, to get your pen over here so you'll make this line next. Well, the other rule of thought is proportion and not knowing exactly where your pen is going to go, <laughs> which is where I am. So I do my two parallel lines first and establish the weight, the width of my letter. And then I can add my stroke in to in between. And the reason I do that is because when I just make this line, I, I tend to make it more rigid and I don't always make the right width of the end. So I do it down, down, and then cross between. Um, Jane's exemplar has this line coming down a little bit more and meeting further down, which is beautiful and you can do that. But it's really not correct. <laughs> I just looked at that exemplar and I went, oh, that's not a very good <laughs> That line really should have more of a curve to it, like Brecken's did. I'm sorry, make it more of a curve. Sometimes my habits <laughs> just show up and sometimes my habits are right and sometimes they aren't. So here's a Roman D, let's see. We're gonna place it and kind of 
rock. I'm not moving the nib. I'm just kind of rocking it back and forth to start the fluid. And I'm pulling down and you can be brave and then pull this stroke this way right here on the bottom. That's the Sheila way. It takes lots of practice to then have your letter proportion meet up at the right place. You can do it, it's just hard. Then I'm thinking about that triangle counter space and then I'm thinking about mother O here. And then I'll come back and meet up right there. Um, let's see. Okay, um, let's do a G. There are two different options for G. I'm looking at the time. You start below like we have been. And think of that mother O. And here's the first G like that. When when I haven't practiced these for <laughs> a while, I will do that, this stroke, this bottom stroke last, because I will want it to make sure that I'm lining it up with the this top stroke here. But since I practiced, I went into autopilot. The other G is what we call the 6G. <laughs> and we'll start in the same place. Notice how slow my strokes are. I'm probably even rushing. If I weren't on camera, I would be going really slow. And that is essential to success with the V-nib is slow and steady pressure. Okay, we didn't do the V or W. You did a W on wizard. Oh, I, a round W. Okay, so here, here is We'll do the W and what you learn from this W, apply it to the V. We're going to have that same slant proportion. It's going to fill about two boxes. Then there are different rules of ductus, but this is what I do and it works for me. I do my two parallel lines first. Then I come back and I do this one, a little suggestion of an entrance stroke, and then start in my ink and retrace and then come down. That's, I probably wanted it to come down a little bit more so that these two lines could be, could be parallel. Let's try it really quickly. So if you have a parallel line here and here and here and here, your W will be more attractive. Um, I just want to say this about that, that W, which is beautiful. When you are squaring off your ends and you want the bottom two points to either be pointed or square, you've got to pay attention to what is going to happen. Because if now, Steve, when Brecken takes that point down, it's going to come way below your line. So if that is your intent, you'll want to stop your stroke a little bit above the 
baseline so that when you point it, it just pierces the baseline. And if you want to square it off, then you're going to take it more down to the baseline. Hope that makes sense. So that's it. <laughs> I had to stop my B nib line right there so that I could point the bottom. Okay, any other, oh, let's do a B because it's a B. <laughs> the same thing, consideration that we made for the R, we're not going to touch the stem in, um, in the middle. And we want optical balance, so our top will be slightly smaller than our bottom. Okay. The, the other thing is the L. We've been using these nice round things. And so our inclination would be to pull that bottom um, that bottom stroke really wide because all of these letters are being really wide. But then that will mess up your spacing. So remember that Anshul came right after Roman and it's inspired by Roman proportions. So our L will be a narrow letter. Okay, I'm stopping here because I don't want to have to push my B nib. I want to pick it up and pull. So I'm having a hard B day. To be or not to be? <laughs> Today's a not to be day. <clears throat> okay. Any letters you we didn't see that you want me to demo before we go over to Jane, who has the really fun alphabet of the day? How about an M? Oh, an M. And the P. I'm not gonna square off those edges so I can do an M. The M, we're gonna think about mother O and we're gonna make it nice and slightly round like her, but it's been stretched a little bit to make it taller. Then I'm gonna start in my ink and come around and I'm watching my counter space. Then I'm gonna come back into my ink and come up and I'm watching my counter space to try and make them even. And then I'm trying to do that. Oh, uh, let's see. When Matt first suggested the lettering types, he had originally said Neugebauer. And so let, in honor of Neugebauer, let's do a Neugebauer A here. And then the P. 
the P is a descender. And remember that our descenders are just barely suggestions of a descender because we're, we're using Unchel, which is a majuscule with a little bit of a hint of ascenders and descenders. I'm going to start in my ink at that same place I was starting for all those other branches. And I'm gonna come around thinking about Mother O and stop when it gets uncomfortable and then come back. Um, if we had O right here, it would fill the full four squares. But because we have this downstroke, we just slice off that bit of the mother O right there. So your P and your Q aren't going to be a full square wide necessarily. They'll be slightly smaller than that because we've sacrificed part of the mother to make the child. <laughs> um, the H. Let's try that. The H and the N that looks like the H, you need to make, you want legibility and your reader in mind when you choose which one to use. I'm going to If you don't have room to give enough space to that ascender, then you might not want to combine these in the same line, in which case you could choose the Roman H or the Roman N instead. Okay, so the very last thing before I send it over, unless you have another letter you wanna see, is you can use this same idea if you're having trouble with the pointed filling in, you can use a black ink and then use a micron to touch up those corners. You could use an ink and then fill a fine fountain pen with the ink you're using and um, and use the fountain pen to touch up the to touch up the ends. And here I didn't touch up the ends and here I did. And you can see there is a little bit of a difference. One looks a little crisper and happier and the other looks a little bit more, um, this one for sure I didn't, looks more casual. So depending on what you want your letters to communicate, you make decisions according to that. Okay. Any questions before I turn it over to Jane? Just so you know, we have 45 of us here, except for Jane has two windows and a couple of you have two people in one window. There we go. I'm just chatting away with my mute button on. <laughs> I think that's awesome to have such a great representation of our group. Um, I love getting together in person, but I have also really enjoyed 
doing it this way because I don't have to haul all my supplies <laughs> down to Salt Lake. It's kind of nice just to have everything at reach if you if you want. So, okay, the, the next hand we're gonna do um, is a Gwen Weaver. No, I'm sorry, Mike Kessig. <laughs> I taught when we were in our essentials class, so <laughs> I forgot. It's Mike Kessig, and he has given us permission to use his handouts. Um, it's such a pretty lettering, and I didn't see this on the website, but I just wanted to show you um, this piece I did that has both the B nib with the squared ends, and in in this case, you can see I did a little bit of a flare, not on purpose, but it just happened that way. Um, but the thing I like about this lettering is that it's, um, and it's called pointed pen unshul. You can do it tightly spaced. And so I, I really like that aspect of it. And then it just is so open and airy. That's another thing I really like about it. And so we thought that would be really fun um, for everyone to learn. Now, some of you have learned it before and you can help when, when I say something that isn't right. Um, with a pointed nib, the idea is for those of you who don't, who maybe have not done pointed nib before, the idea is that when you push on it, it splays or opens and gives you a thicker stroke. And so this lettering is a what is considered a pressurized lettering, meaning that some of the strokes have a thicker stroke and some have a thinner stroke. Now I apologize because when I took Mike Kessig's class, I wasn't very faithful in taking notes. I'm not a good note taker like Brecken is. And I, I just go for it and do the letters. And so I didn't really have very many notes on my page of, of how to do things or why, so, but it's a lettering that I love and I did have just one or two notes on it. I also don't remember for sure if he used a straight holder or an oblique holder. Now I have done it both ways and you can do what's comfortable for you. Sometimes I have liked doing it with a straight holder, but when I practiced this with teaching in mind, I found it easier to use an oblique holder to be able to get these angles, a letter that goes at a slant like that to get the fix of this line right here it was easier with an oblique holder to pull it this way. It's also a little easier if you tip your paper. Now see how much easier that round letter is. And if I'm going to pull, push and, and get the pressure on that stroke, it's easier with an oblique holder. That being said, I have done it both ways with a straight or an oblique. The other thing that I will point out is that in Mike Kessig's handouts, and let me just grab, no, those are the same ones. He's got two different ones. Okay, he has this one that we sent you. And then he has this one that has the pointed penuncial on the side and the whole alphabet done closely at the bottom. This one, the letters are more round. Um, the round letters are more round. And on this one, they're more oblong, if that makes sense. So when I traced this one, I found that the letters were about three, oh, and I will say this, if I reduced it to 90%, it was, three eighths of an inch tall and four eighths or half an inch wide. The rounded one, I, di I didn't trace it, but I'm guessing that it's more like three and a half 
three to three and a half wide and three tall once you reduced it 90%. Um, I think he must have done it with metric and, and I don't work well with metric. So I have to get it down to eighths of an inch for my grid pad. So, th so that's what I did was to reduce it 90 to 90% 90 so that it would work so that I could really see what the proportions were um, so that I could help you understand that. Okay, so when you, and here I've got my straight pin in my hand just to show you this. When you do a stroke, you're gonna put your pin down and then you push a little bit, get that in focus, to open the thing, the tines, and then you pull the stroke down and then you're gonna push a little bit more at the bottom. Now I have noticed in working with Mike's exemplars that my letters tend to be a little lighter. Um, my down strokes are a little bit too light. I'm a little light handed on it. Like on this exemplar that I did, I think these down strokes and these don't look too bad, but they are a little bit lighter than his are. And so his really is the, the, the exemplar you want to look at for the letter. Mine was mostly to show you the ductus of how to do the strokes. Um, I'm going to change and do my oblique holder. So on the top of this exemplar, I gave you some of the basic strokes. There's the vertical stroke that I just did, the round strokes for the ellipse or the round letters, the tick mark, which the tick mark is just putting your nib down, spreading the tines and, and then just pulling it. And you can get as little or as much as you want, but it's an important part of this alphabet. Always done at an angle. So when I've got my paper at a comfortable handwriting angle, I've got my nib is basically pointing perpendicular to me. And I'm gonna pull it to the left to get that tick mark. Now, Mike Kessig, and I found the video that I took of him when I took his class to show how he splays his nibs and gets a nice square end on it. And I watched it over and over again yesterday. And I'm sorry, I just have a really hard time getting it. But he, he puts it down and he spreads it and then pulls it. And, and he gets such a nice square corner on, on this. I'm gonna just exaggerate, but he, he just gets he gets a really nice square corner. And so on his down strokes, he, he puts it down. And, it, and again, like Brecken said, it's not a quick, it's, it's more slow and deliberate. Mine always tend to be just a little bit rounded. And I wish that I could get it like his, but I will still work on it. So in looking at these, I'm going to, I want to do some of the straight ones first, and then we'll get into the curves. So after the eye, the eye is just plain. And, and like Unshul, this is a majuscule alphabet. So there's not uppercase and lowercase, same as what Brecken just did. Um, the J, you start with a pressurized stroke, you lift your pen a little bit, you push down just a little bit right here to give it a little bit of weight and then bring it over. The thing you'll wanna watch out for is if you're going to do letters at three eighths of an inch tall and have an eighth of an inch in between, 
you can see that that J, if I bring it down that far, is going to go into the line below. So if you're going to do that, I would suggest bringing the J just above the eighth of an inch so that it doesn't run into the other letters. If you have a space that it could go down, I'd take it down. Um, you'll just have to be aware of that. Okay, the H, I thought it was interesting that even though this is an uncial alphabet, he sticks with the Roman H. And on my notes, the one thing that I did write on my notes was the H and the T are wide and straight and square. Now let me find, to find my notes. Mm -hmm, I had it here. Jane, uh -huh. maybe the reason that he doesn't go to more of a lowercase look on that, but it sticks with the Roman, is because if you look at all of his letters, there is nothing taller. Like the L doesn't go above. Right. The R doesn't. You know, maybe the J a little bit. The R, nothing. They're all well within that. Those. Right. So I wrote on my notes, the H and the T need to be square, not rolling along. I don't know what he meant by rolling along, but he, he wants the H and the T to be square. So it's a Roman H and it's just two down strokes. And I think they're about three eighths of an inch apart. And then when you add the crossbar, which is that swoopy stroke, and he puts weight at the beginning and at the end. And then this middle part is basically just letting your pen glide across so that you don't have thicks and thins. This needs a little more weight at the bottom. So when by the time you add this crossbar, it ends up being about four, about a half an inch wide. Okay, the L, as in the alphabet we just did with the B nib, the L is not as wide. So you've got your basic vertical stroke and then you come just to the left of it and a little bit below. So you can do a slight curve and you're gonna be about two eighths of an inch past your vertical stroke and then do the tick mark. Now that can be done in one stroke if you do that. Yeah, that, that's in the wrong place. The T starts with the tick mark and, and you don't have to lift your pen at that point. You can do the tick mark, although the tick mark works better if you lift your pen just a little bit and then come back and do your downstroke. Now his T is plenty wide and probably wider than that. That's another thing that I wrote on my notes from his class was wider, wider, wider. I, I wrote that on several letters. I have a tendency not to make them as wide as they should, but you can give it a full half an inch on that top and then add your vertical stroke. The K starts with a vertical stroke. And then I noticed that his two exemplars have two different Ks. So one K is like this, that it doesn't cross, doesn't touch the vertical stroke. And you start about three eighths of an inch over and bring it in and down to the about one inch or one eighth of an inch. 
And then I like to turn my pen a little bit so that I can get a better thick stroke right there. And then this stroke is your, this, here's your half inch right here. The other K he does, he brings this stroke into the crossbar and then just a little tiny bit away from the crossbar, he does that stroke. I don't know from looking at his, his looks wider here. And I had several different versions of K's on my original work from his class. I, I think he must turn his pen to get a thicker stroke here this way, because if you don't, you have a harder time getting it thick enough on that leg. And the weight on that leg, I think, is one of the things that makes that last stroke beautiful. I didn't talk about the difference in pointed nibs. Now, I've done this with an EF66, but it's hard because it's so pointed that you have to really be careful when you're doing like a little bit going to the side or when you get to the circle strokes, like on an A when, or a U, when you have to go back up again, it's hard. In, pre in preparing for this, I went through every pointed nib I have just to see which ones I liked the best. The Hunt 101 gives a fatter line and maybe it's because mine is well used, but it really splayed and gave a, a fat, thick part. I didn't like that as well. I found that the Nico G, which is what this one is, or the Zebra G, or the one I've got in this um, straight holder is a Tachikawa G. And I liked those better. They're a stiffer nib. It was easier for me to do an upstroke with them without having it catch the paper and spray ink everywhere. But if you have a favorite pointed nib, use it. Okay, the X. The diagonal stroke on the first stroke of the X is about two nibs wide. And if you need to make a couple little dots and you're going to do the thick, release it just a little and thick again. And that's not very straight. Maybe turn, maybe turn your paper straighter. Let's try that. See, that helped me to turn my paper straight so that my pen was at an angle. Then there are two ways you can do it. You can do it starting at the bottom, but then you're pushing the stroke and then add your tick mark. Or you can do the tick mark first and come down. And that's typically what I like to do. Because also if you had an X on the very bottom line, you could take that stroke down if, if it fit, it's just, you know, you have to be aware of what's going on in your piece. The same with the V, but I really think the V is better if you go up. So that you've got the same, I'm gonna turn my paper because I've got the same diagonal stroke. And then I'm gonna go up. And some of the things I've seen just barely take it above Sometimes things I've looked at don't have a tick mark on them. And I'm thinking his, yes, one of his exemplars has a tick mark and one does not. So um, you can leave it like that. If you've got another letter going in right here, I wouldn't put the tick mark on it. But um, if you have,
and I can't even think of one word that would do it, but if you had a word that was VU, then you would want to use this tick mark to do your U because the U has a tick mark on it. That's one thing if you, and then, and maybe that's too far apart, but you would, you would not take this line up as far. That's one thing with these two hey. marks. No. Yes. On, on your uh, V up on top, I can't see the grid marks very well. So like how wide is the one stroke from the other on top? Okay, so here's, this is a quarter of an inch. Here's half an inch. And here's the half inch line. So sometimes you'll just take it barely above the half inch line. And sometimes you can take it higher. If it's on the top line, you could take it even higher. And so the same on the X, it goes past the, the yes. quarter inch? Yes, sometimes it's just like just to the half inch line as far as height, the waistline. And sometimes it comes a little bit above. And and you just get to decide what, you know, depending on what letter you have. Like I have a Max and an Alex in my family. And so I, if I were doing their names, I would, you know, I would take it out and make it, if you were just doing a name. If you're doing text and you've got a bunch of lines together, then you have to not do things like that as much, only when you feel like they fit in the space if they're not interfering with the line above or below, that kind of thing. Does that answer okay. your question? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, the Z. The Z can be done in several strokes or kind of one stroke. Um, and on the ductus that I gave you, I did it in four strokes, but here's how it goes. So you've got your tick mark and, and then you go a little slight line and you want that to be about three eighths of an inch wide. And then this line is one of those soft S's that you start here and you do and you pressurize in the middle so that you get a good thickness here. And then you take another little slight curve and a tick mark. Then you can do the crossbar. And you can make that as little or as wide as you need to depending on your word. If I were writing something that ended in Z, I would take it out. If I were writing something that the Z is in the middle, like zoo, and you've got an O right after, you could maybe take it to the middle of the O, but you wouldn't have to even cross the O if you want. If it looks better just to keep it in front of the O, then do that. Okay, the next group of letters are the, are starting the, the round ones. And I'm going to start actually with the O down here. If you'll notice on Mike's exemplar, he does his O in two strokes. He starts here and goes around so that he can pressure. And then he starts here and goes around so that he can get pressure. Now the O and the Q are the only ones that have the pressure on both sides of that ellipse. The others, you can see the A and the C, the D, they and the P, any of the others only have pressure on one side. And so we're gonna start with that. He does his in two, two strokes. So he starts about here and does this. And then he starts about here and does this. 
Now I, you can see, I can't always line that up. So here's a little trick that I do. I start here and I go around and I pressure and then I keep going so that I get my shape and finish my shape. And this is a Reggie trick, up with the shape, down with the weight. Then I come down and add a little weight to that side and that's not enough. But it's easier for me to do that so that I get my connections on that. I'm still working on doing it in two strokes, but I'm just saying that's a little trick you can do to get your O shape with that if that's a problem for you. Maybe it's easier for you than it is for me. And so then the Q is the same thing. The other thing that I have had problems with is making it round enough. I, I have a tendency to kind of do them skinnier. And so that's one thing with this alphabet is it is beautiful, but you've got to make sure that your round shapes are round enough. Now he does two different cues. One he, one he puts the tail just from the thick part of this right side of that ellipse. And the other one, he brings it through. So I'm guessing you can choose which one you like and do it either way. Well, oh, that was not a very good. I kind of like the one without going through, but you can decide. Okay, so now we've talked about the ellipse. So going to the letters, and I'm gonna just dab these so they're not wet and gooey. So you can see then that the C is basically almost the first stroke of the O. So you're gonna do a tick mark and then a and then you go back into it, or if it's easier for you to just do the tick mark and not lift your pen, do that. And then you bring your pressure and then you're gonna bring your next, instead of closing it, you're just gonna stop. And it's a nice thin stroke. Now, one thing I have seen a lot of, um, text where the stroke here, the exit stroke, can go into the next letter. And I think it's really cool when, you're in, when your exit strokes do that. Like if you were going to do an R next, then you've got, you know, you've got that connection. But I wrote the word cheer and with an H next to it, it made it look like a G. So when, you, when you're writing words, make sure you pay attention to things like that. Because I thought, oh, this will be so cool to connect it to the H. And then by the time I got done, I was like, oh, that looks like a G, not a C. So be aware of stuff like that. Okay, the E is the, is the same as the C, tick mark, do your oval shape, bring your exit out, and then you're going to do the crossbar, which has weight at the end and at the beginning. And you can bring it out or you can leave it in, depending on what letter you have in front or behind. Sometimes you'll want to keep it within the bounds of that ellipse shape. Okay, G is basically the same as a C. You bring your stroke even with the top part of the letter. 
And then you're going to do a vertical stroke and that wasn't good because it didn't. Then you just do a vertical stroke on the, that's better. But you can see how if I had an H right here after the C, if I connected them, it would look like a G. The A. Now the A stroke, the A is, a, is not quite as round at this top part as the O. So you're gonna start here, you're gonna do the pressurized part and then you bring up your pen. So it's a, almost more like a teardrop shape maybe. And then you do your vertical stroke. We did O and Q. The U does a vertical stroke first and a little curvy stroke. And then you're going to finish what you would do with an A. And you can picture if the A were like this. And then your vertical stroke. The Y is the same as the U. And on his exemplars, he has two different, one, one downstroke, downstroke uh, what's it called, tail, just is shorter. And the other one he has coming out a little bit more and a little more curve on that stroke. See this one, if you look at the curve on that one, if he brings that one over a little further, it's pretty. The W, you start like a U. The W is about six eighths of an inch, three quarters of an inch wide. So it's a pretty wide letter. Um, you start with the tick mark, just like the U. And in fact, it the whole thing is like a U, that first part. And then you're gonna come straight down with some weight and do a U shape. And that's maybe a little too square on that side. And then a vertical, this is too square right here. That's better. I looked at this letter on his exemplar with my little grid that I use for Roman letters. It's a clear plastic. And where they were the same width was about one eighth inch down. If that gives you an idea of how wide to make each stroke, they were about the same from here to here as they are from here to here. Okay, now most of these letters we just did have the weight on the left side. Now we're gonna do the letters that have the weight on the right side. We're gonna start with the letter D. Now this D that I first did is not high enough on the top. But you start with a downstroke, pressure, release, pressure. And then while your nib is still here, you're going to come up and you're going to start your branch about an eighth of an inch and make sure you get it round enough on top. And I'm not at the right angle. I got to change this.
bring it around as if you were going to do the A upside down, which would be a more of a teardrop shape, but don't connect it on the bottom. The P is kind of the same, um, only the P has more of a descender. Don't go more than one eighth of an inch because if you're stacking these an eighth of an inch in between, you won't want it to interfere. And then it's just going to be the same shape. And don't close it off. Let's see if it's any easier to do it this way. Maybe a little easier to do it straight. I don't know. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it just depends on what my hand is doing for the day. Okay, B. Now on the exemplar I gave you, I had you doing the second stroke in one, in this, the second half of a letter. So you start with your down stroke, then you're gonna come up and branch. And you can do it that way, but in looking at his further, I think it almost looks like he stops there and then comes back in with another, because if you look at his, this is more curving down. You can do it in one stroke. That's not wide enough though. But I think the nuance of and I want to look at his second exemplar. You know what? They do look different. Okay, let's look at this. Okay, now see how that one looks. It really looks like this is one elliptical shape right here. Like he stopped maybe here and then started here and did an elliptical shape. And then look at this one. This looks more like he did it in one stroke, doesn't it? Be aware that <laughs> there are differences. And I don't think it's bad to do it in one stroke. You do just need to get it wide enough. That one was better. Still not quite wide enough. Okay, the R starts as a vertical stroke. Then you're going to go wide like you were doing a D, then pressure, bring it back about that far. So you're about almost an eighth of an inch from the vertical stroke and almost an eighth of an inch up. And then I like to turn my pen so that I get a nice thick stroke right there. Just think it adds to the beauty of it. You do have to be careful with this join right here. Um, make sure that it, and you don't wanna, you don't wanna necessarily touch it up too much, but you, you just, want to have it look like, you want it to look like it was in one stroke. Okay, F. Vertical stroke and the F, the F and the G both on this exemplar, he puts the F below the line. The G is still above, but look on this exemplar, he's got a little arrow and a line, meaning that either one of them, you could take down below the line and make it a descender. So 
So you start with the vertical stroke. I like the F to go down below. And then you're gonna take it wide. The other thing, so think about your D stroke. The other thing is he did two different tops. Now, one of them he did just with a little bit of weight on that with a nice curve and then did his crossbar, which he does almost as wide as the letter itself. And then the other one he did like this with the tick mark. Personally, I like the one without the tick mark on the F. There's enough letters that have the tick marks, I think, that I, I think the F that just curves is prettier. But you've got to make sure that you give it just a little bit of weight as you exit that stroke. And then again, if you need to, you can keep it the same width, same height as the others. N starts with a vertical stroke. Then you're gonna do a nice round and then a little curve and then a tick mark. I think the letters with the tick marks and these little curves like the U and the Y and the N, they're fun to do once you get to know the letters and you can do them in a rhythm. They're really kind of fun. M is just an upside down W and you're gonna do a kind of a straight, you do an arc and a straight down for the middle and then you're gonna do, and then you're gonna branch out and do the curve. Sometimes on his, well, most of the time on his, he brings his out, his little curvy line here. He brings it out quite a bit, a little bit longer than I do. You'll just have to see what works for you and what works with the letter that you've got after it, that kind of thing. Okay, one more letter and it's the only one that has, besides the O and the Q, that has the left curve and the right curve with pressure. So I start with the tick mark and then pressure and then you're doing kind of a vertical stroke and then pressure and bringing it up. That looks really wide next to this one, but this really is more, because see here's a half an inch. This, this S was too skinny. You can also add just a little tiny bit of weight on that exit stroke. That kind of helps to complete it, I think. On one of his exemplars, he, he brings it up just a little more curvy on the on that exit. Okay, the only other thing I was going to point out to you was um, we talked about it a little bit with the tick marks. When I wrote, look what happened when I wrote ductus. There's the tick mark for the C, that in which also is for the T and also is for the U. So these letters can be combined like that so that you don't have too many things going on, which I think that's kind of fun. Um, here's another place where I joined the E and the D. Like we talked about the C and the e. just be careful of C and H <laughs> because you don't want it to look like a G. Okay, any other questions or, or letters you'd like to see again? Can you do the S's again? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going, I'm going to mark so you can see. Here's half an inch by three eighths of an inch. I'm gonna start there.
Oh, that's a terrible S. And that one is, okay, just because you asked me, Lily, I can't do it now. Jane? What? On the two uh, exemplars, uh -huh. on the on the one that is not the round one, mm -hmm. the the bottom of the S just comes like the same, like you just did at the same uh, spot as the tick mark. But on the other one, actually it goes out a little bit farther on the bottom. You know what I mean? You don't line them up as much. It just seems like it's a little bit wider on the bottom. Yeah, you know, let me get my little clear thing. Sorry, I should have had that here ready to look at. Okay, let's put this on here. Okay, so can you see Here's the right side of that down of that bottom stroke and the top comes in a little bit, but with your tick mark is outside of it. And then here's this one. So this is one, two and a half squares, but three by the time you count the tick mark. And then you're gonna go around and this one is a little bit outside. So from here, to here is about three and a half squares. Now let's look at the other one. Okay, now you can see he started his stroke here, which is the same, you know, I, I would say there's not a real, real definitive. I mean, it's, they're obviously different. I would just worry that this counter space on the top is smaller than the bottom and then getting your, your pressure and the right places would be probably the goal of what, you know, what you would really want to look for. I, I don't, and you know, it's hard to do them perfect every time, but of course you want to practice so that they are. Now I'm going to try it with a, a straight holder. Let's see if I get any different result. It, it seems to me that it stands up straighter rather than slant easier if it's a straight holder. I think it's easier to do with an oblique. Lily, does that give you enough clues on the S? Yeah, that helps. You know, honestly, because I have a light box, I trace things. And I traced Mike Kessig's exemplar a lot, trying to get the shapes. And, you know, there's just nothing wrong with doing that. I think it's it just helps you to get a feel for the person that created it how they intend it to be. Jane, is this lettering always need to be at three eighths or can it go to a quarter inch and not lose integrity or? No, I think you can do it at any size that you want. I really do. Just, you know, you'll just want to be aware of the shapes, keeping the shapes the same. And, and I have done this smaller. In fact, let me think of something. 
Well, I can't even find it right now. I, I wrote it even eighth of an inch. As long as you know that they are wider than they are tall, and keep and and when you know where the pressure goes it's possible to do them really small or really big and, and if you're doing them bigger you may want a nib that spreads out a little bit more that is a little more flexible than the nico g or the zebra g but um you can decide that cool thanks okay. I was just going to talk about one other thing. When Matt told us the Hobbit, Hobbit lettering, I got online and this was the one that I found that I that kind of looked to me most like Hobbit lettering. And so I analyzed it and and I tried, I tried to kind of do it, but so what was happening with this is I just think they're not as careful with their forms. <laughs> I'm a calligraphy snob. <laughs> and so this age is not pretty to me, but if it makes you feel like it looks more hobbitish, then do it. So, so I kind of did some of it and kind of not. The other thing I thought was, well, they're dragging out things. Um, and then they're adding the three little dots. I really didn't care for this that much. I tried to duplicate it and I still didn't care for it. So then I just did an, an okay unshell with trying to, you know, drag out the some of the strokes. And then I used a small nib to do the three little dots and I thought you know if if someone was just looking at that they might have the idea that it is a hobbit lettering anyway so that was just a thought if you if you want to do something kind of hobbitish then look at that look at those kind of changes with just a regular unshell okay that's Unless anyone has any other questions. I do, Jane. Okay. So I have a hard time getting my fix on the O and the Q. So they're kind of vertical, one straight through. Mine want to be on both sides, like side by side, instead of at a like on an axis. Right. And and you know, mine aren't exact either. And if you look at his, his are doing that are going on this axis this, this way he, you know mine don't go exactly that i i try to get them there um i do think it helps to turn your paper a little bit i also think it helps to use the oblique holder so that you're you know it's almost a copper plate sort of feel when you're writing um then you can get your probably i would say probably turn your paper are you turning your paper yeah i've got it like perpendicular like <laughs> almost straight up and down just because of the way i turn my wrist um so if i'm so if i'm doing it perpendicular to me no, I mean like a 45 to like a 90 degree angle to me. Like that? Yeah, that's how I have to turn it to get the fix in the right place. Oh, wow. Janice, so, are you using an oblique or straight? I tried both. You know, <laughs> that was easier to make the connection on the top and the bottom when I turned it that much, but it's also more, more flat. I feel like this way. I don't know. Um, this is almost a 45. Uh, 
Yeah, I don't know. I This is about a 45 degree angle and I've got my pen perpendicular to me, to my body. And Jane did Mike right with at a 45 degree. How did he have his paper? You know, I, I think maybe a slight angle. Again, I'm sorry, I didn't take very good notes. <laughs> And it looked on, on the video, it looked like it was maybe at a little angle, but I was holding my phone right above his head, you know, so I, I didn't get a clear view of how he was doing that. I'm going to pay better attention when I take workshops from now on, <laughs> because I, when I got into this, I thought, you know what, I should have written that down instead of just doing it. I, I just want to do it. And so... Um, you get my version as the best way that I do it. I, I think, Janice, I liked the shape that I get when I get, when I do my paper just slightly, almost more like a handwriting angle, and then, and then use the oblique perpendicular to me. And again, it, you know, that, that is a harder, stroke to do and I and I generally have to do it in one and then come back with the weight up with the shape down with the weight like Reggie says so okay thank you uh -huh. are there any other questions okay do we have homework an envelope a word you gave us this you gave us the precious all right, precious, and then the mm -hmm. phrase of the month will, will be even the smallest person can change the course of the future. Maybe we can put that on our Facebook page. Is everyone on Facebook no. with or emails or maybe we can put it on the Instagram. Uh, Brett, Brett can puts it on Instagram. Okay, we'll get it out. And then this, both of these are really good for envelopes for the main name on the envelope so you can have fun with it big or small so um, another quote you can do is uh you shall not pass and then hang it next to the toilet in your bedroom in your bathroom <laughs> some people get that some people go what okay that's okay um little potty humor there um okay are there any questions about what we're doing the next month or anything with last month uh, anything you want to see from Anshul. This is a very beautiful hand and a lot of variation. So just if you type in in Pinterest Anshul, you're going to get an overload very easily. So it's a lot of fun. Any questions? I, I just was going to show you, and I don't know if you can see it in this. Um, I used, which way is that? No, oh, this way. I ended up using this lettering for my grandchildren's Valentines. And um, I used a, now am I on, is this camera on? I don't have my. No, we see your mug, your face. Which one do you want? Oh, you muted yourself. <laughs> There you go. Okay, anyway, I I used uh, that gel pen that is a glaze pen that Susie Brown showed us in her workshop, but I did this style of lettering, and then I um, let me find. Oh, here's another. It's not focusing very well. But then I did, um, I enhanced them with white to send the Valentines to the grandkids. Anyway, it was fun. It was a fun, it was a fun lettering to use for envelopes. Cool. And we do have St. Patrick's Day coming up yeah. next month. So you've got a month to prepare and do some St. Patrick's Eve type stuff. Yeah. Wonderful.
Matt? Yes. It's Matt. If you can have, if you guys can have Rodia pads for next month, you'll have a lot nicer time writing. Hmm. So it's up to you. You could do it on anything, but I'm going to have a guideline that fits underneath the page and um, makes it way easier to write. And this is like the size 18, number 18. Is this Janet? Sounds like yeah. Janet. Mm -hmm. Yes, me. Okay, you're teaching, uh, I've got you teaching copper plate in May and June. Oh, I was told April, March and April, so. Oh, <laughs> okay, we'll figure that out. Okay, yeah, uh, I'm glad you know. brought that up. Yeah, let me know, because I was told March and April. Okay, because I thought we had book hand next for um, March and April. So we'll figure it out, folks. <laughs> yeah, just let me know ahead of time. Well, okay. then, then that gives them extra time to get a rhodia pad for whenever Jan teaches. Yeah. What is a rodeo pad? It's a pad of paper that's fine. It's ink friendly. It's just blank. Get the blank one. You can get a grid one, but where do you get it? Blick or John Neal or anywhere. <laughs> yeah, the rodeo pad is really good for pointed pen. Yeah, it, it takes pointed pen really well. You can get it on Amazon too. Good to know. Okay. Uh, is there anything else, folks? We had a lot of people. We had 45. That was really, I, actually, I saw 46 at one point. So um, that's when, wonderful. That's a full. Sorry. When you send homework pieces, take a picture and send it to Liz and also to me. And I'll feature you on the Instagram, the Guild Instagram thing. We had some great work um, that I that I stole from other people who post on Instagram. But let's let's try not and isolate ourselves and share your work and be proud of where you're at right now. I agree. I agree. Alrighty. Anything else? So fun to see everybody. Next month's meeting, Erin is asking, is it'll be the third Saturday, so March 20th. Okay, I'll stop the recording so you can all uh, say goodbye, I love you to everyone. <laughs>